Yes, Tim. Okay. Okay. I've given you full pro pro authority now. Okay. Okay. Once again, welcome. Um, the campus theme of uh, 21 uh, winter. And I'm pleased to announce to you that this is our 13th year. Uh, the campus theme began about 13 years ago, uh, initiated by SOU as a way to engage the campus community and our larger community in intellectually stimulating conversations about various topics. And as many of you know, we have discussed issues of race, on revolution, on being human. We have looked at a range of issues. And last year, we started to talk about uncertainty, depending on the situation at that time. But we never expected that we would be continuing that theme this year for reasons that are to some extent obvious, the uncertainty of the nature of things that we are all surrounded by. So this is our uh, uh, winter term program. The fall term, we had to make some adjustments. Uh, this is our second program in winter, and we have two more programs coming uh, up, and I will announce that in a minute. Uh, support for the campus theme comes from our provost's office, Dr. Sue Walsh, uh, who has kindly been very supportive from the beginning of the program, and we are very grateful to her for her support. The next two programs that we have are one coming up on February 28th. It is by a friend of ours, uh, the titled Uncertainty and the Buddhist Perspective by Dan Lee who is a practitioner of Buddhism, and he will be speaking from about the concept of uncertainty from a Buddhist perspective. Following that, we will have on March 4th, um, a talk titled A Pathway to Peace, Making Friends with Uncertainty by Dr. Fred Gruy, who has actually spoken before as part of the campus theme. Um, and he will be, he is a chaplain in the local hospital. So he'll be talking about uncertainty and how to uh, engage with the concept from a totally different perspective than uh, what uh, Dan Lee will be doing in a couple of weeks. So with that, I'd like to invite my friend and colleague, Justin Harmon to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to clarify that the, the Buddhism and Uncertainty talk is actually on Thursday, February 25th. And in addition oh, yeah. to a very good friend of mine, Dan Lee, he'll be accompanied by uh, Yoki Kane Barrett, who is currently the Bishop uh, the North American Bishop for the Nietzschean Order of, of Buddhism. Um, that's going to be really exciting. She's the, the first woman, the first Black, and the first Westerner to hold that position. And, and I imagine she'll have a number of really essential insights for us on the Buddhist perspective or um, a broad Buddhist perspective and its connection to uncertainty. But um, it's my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Graham Harmon who is currently, currently holds the position of Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles, and has taught previously at the American University in Cairo, um, also the European Graduate School. Uh, Professor Harmon has authored numerous articles and some 18 books, including uh, most recently Skirmishes, which caught me by surprise. It evidently came out in November of just this last year, 2020. Um, Art and Objects in 2019, Object-Oriented Ontology, A New Theory of Everything from 2018, and in 2016, he published Immaterialism. Harmon has been considered among the most in influential living um, philosophers in the world, um, and he was named by Art Review Magazine as one of the 100 most influential figures in international art. And Graham Harmon is a bold thinker who tonight invites us to think along with him uh, beyond the uh, stultifying conditions of our uncertain present to think about this kind of metaphysical, this fundamental metaphysical uncertainty that undergirds our very existence, even under more normal or, or pleasant circumstances, as both inescapable and a positive pathway to truth. So um, please join me in welcoming Professor Harmon to our uh, virtual intellectual community here at SOU to present his talk titled Justified Untrue Belief. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And again, I'm not seeing above my name, there's just a black square. I hope everybody can see me. Yes. Oh, okay. For some reason, yeah. I can see myself. All right. I've been asked to speak for about an hour and I'm speaking from notes extemporaneously. So I'll try to keep an eye on the clock and keep this in the right framework time-wise. I'm going to start by talking about object-oriented ontology 
which is abbreviated OOO, pronounced triple O sometimes, which is the sort of philosophy I've helped develop over the last 15, 20 years. And it's, as the name suggests, object-oriented. It's a name I stole from computer science without being directly inspired by it. Uh, it's a philosophy in which individual objects stand at the center of things. And that's not entirely new in the history of philosophy. There have been various other philosophies that focused on individual entities. The most famous probably being the whole line that goes from Aristotle up through the Middle Ages to Leibniz in the early 1700s, where individual entities are the main characters in philosophy, the things that are at the center of everything. But there are quite a few differences between Triple O and these traditional approaches. One of them is that quite often, philosophies of objects have been focused on objects that exist by nature and that are simple. So you could talk about plants and animals and humans as being objects, but not machines. For example, Leibniz, in one of his letters to another philosopher, makes fun of the idea that the Dutch East India Company, the world's first corporation, could be an individual thing. And so uh, even though I like Leibniz, I wrote a whole book to prove him wrong called Immaterialism, where I did a whole philosophical history of the Dutch East India Company and tried to show that even though it's not natural, even though it's made of many different pieces, it can still be treated as an object philosophically. And this is very important because many of the objects we're interested in now uh, don't exist by nature, whether it's COVID vaccines or uh, airplanes, robots, uh, the world is more and more filled with very complex things that do not exist by nature, and we want to be able to develop philosophical approaches to deal with them. Uh, the other aspect of triple O is that we don't think that objects are accessible directly. You can't know anything directly. This has something to do with, with what Immanuel Kant called the thing in itself, the fact that the way reality is can't be directly contacted because we are encountering objects through the structures of human knowledge and not from a vacuum. Uh, but in fact, this also goes back much before Kant. For example, Aristotle already said, you can't define a substance, you can't define an object, because definitions all use universals. They use language. They use words like white and human and uh, uh, justice, uh, or just, sorry, words that, you, that are not concrete. They're universals that apply to many different objects, whereas objects are always concrete. And so even Aristotle saw that there's a problem. Uh, in trying to gain knowledge of the things. There's a, a conflict of registers there. Things are always concrete, language is always universal, just as thought is always universal. But the real origin of this for me is in, in the philosophy of Heidegger. Uh, Heidegger who talks about being is something which hides, something that is veiled from us behind all the individual beings. And he talks about a term that he, he uses withdrawal. So, uh, reality withdraws from direct access to humans. And that's where I uh, got this notion from wrestling with Heidegger a lot in my 20s from my PhD work. And that's kind of the origin of all of this for me. Now, there are also other philosophies of objects more recently. There's this guy, Alexius Meinung, uh, coming from Austria. He does a theory of objects, as do some of the other Austrian philosophers around 1900, give or take a decade. But what they're usually interested in is the way objects are present to human thoughts. What can we say about objects? What can we know about them? What does it mean when we point to an object without being able to see it? These kinds of questions. Uh, Triple O is also interested in object-object relations. And this is something that has been largely absent from philosophy for the past two centuries because we generally let the natural sciences deal with this, right? We assume that the hard sciences deal with the collisions between rocks and, chem and the interaction of chemicals and things like this. And, so we assume that they, they can handle that just fine. And so then we are left in philosophy with talking about this single gap between thought and the world. We become very limited in what we talk about. And there are occasional exceptions. There's a, a 20th century English philosopher, Alfred North Whitehead, who very boldly tried to talk about object-object interactions in the same terms as thought world interactions. Uh, and though he's a very important philosopher, his reward has been that he's considered somewhat of a freak by both the analytic and continental trends in philosophy. Neither of them really accept him as one of their own. So there's a price to be paid. You can be considered a crackpot if you're a philosopher these days who wants to talk about object-object interactions. And much of the criticism I get uh, comes on that very point. So uh, let me start by talking about three terms that are technical terms in my philosophy. And I don't can everyone see the chat window? I might as well tap these words, type these words in the uh, chat window. First is undermining. There are three different ways you can get rid of objects and say that objects should not be at the center of things. Uh, 
One of them, and this is how philosophy started in, pre -Socratic, in the pre-Socratic period of ancient Greece, is you try to find the smallest thing that's much tinier than objects that all objects are made of. So you can say, well, there aren't really horses and trees and cows and houses. There is something very small that all of that is made of. And the first answer to that was water, according to the Thales of Miletus, everything's made of water. There were other answers, such as everything's made of air, everything's made of atoms, which is still somewhat respectable today. Everything's made of air, earth, fire, and water, joined by love and separated by hate. And then there was another theory, uh, everything is this aperon, which we don't translate from Greek, this kind of formless giant blob that everything is part of. There's really just this one formless lump. Everything else is either illusory or it will go back into this lump later. So when you undermine, you're trying to say that objects don't really matter, objects at the mid-sized level that we encounter, because you have to go very deep and you get down to some very, very tiny thing that explains everything. There's a couple of problems with that. One of them is that we never really find that tiniest level, right? When atoms were verified to exist, soon enough protons and neutrons and electrons were found. And uh, then it was quarks and electrons are the two ingredients. And now there are strings, if string theory is correct. And we don't even know if strings are the smallest no one's ever actually found this smallest level. So it's a hypothesis. The other problem is that it can't really explain what we call emergence, right? Emergence is when something exists that isn't just the sum of its parts. So famously, uh, water as H2O. Water has properties that neither hydro hydrogen nor oxygen have. Uh, most importantly, hydrogen and oxygen are both fuel for fire. They make fire more intense. Water puts it out. Isn't that strange? You take two things that fuel fire and you put them together, they quench fire. And so that's an emergent property in water that you don't find in its parts. Or the emergent properties of Los Angeles. You know, if you just had everybody in Los Angeles standing naked in a field, it wouldn't be Los Angeles, right? You need to have all the people combined in some way with other, you know, not just clothing, but also vehicles and buildings. All of these things together create an emergent whole called Los Angeles that isn't explainable as the sum of their parts. So that's the reason that undermining doesn't always work. We can't get rid of it, right? We need this for scientific explanation. We need to be able to decompose things into their tiniest pieces and use that to explain things that happen in the world, but it can't exhaust the world. Knowing that water is made of hydrogen and oxygen cannot explain, or it might be able to explain, but it's not the same thing as all of the things that we see water do. Okay, the, the opposite of that, which is more common in modern times, I call overmining. I had to coin a word. Overmining means rather than thinking that objects are too shallow to be the truth and you have to go deeper, you think that objects are too deep to be the truth. And so you have to stay on the surface. You have to stay on the level of what humans perceive. You have to stay on the level of language or you have to stay on the level of how things affect each other. There's nothing hidden beneath that. A thing simply is what it does. Uh, Bruno Latour, one of my favorite living philosophers uh, is somewhat guilty of this nonetheless. He says that an object, which he calls an actor, is nothing more than what it does. It's not some substance hiding behind its actions. It is its actions. The problem with under overmining theories, which are again useful in many cases, is that they can't really explain how things change, right? Because if a thing is nothing more than its actions, how is it capable of new actions in the future that you're not seeing now? There has to be something in it that is currently unexpressed that can be expressed later. Uh, this Aristotle, again, said this in his book, The Metaphysics. There were some philosophers in his time called the Megarians who claim that no one is a house builder unless they're building the house right now. And Aristotle talks about the absurdity of this. If someone's a master house builder who happens to be asleep, they're still a house builder in a certain sense, right? Because they can wake up and then start building in a way that I cannot. And so uh, the thing is never fully expressed in its current relations. That's the critique of overmining. And then dual mining is simply a word that I uh, coined because undermining and overmining usually go together at the same time because they both have their weaknesses and people combine them. So for example, take scientific materialism in its usual version. Is it undermining or overmining? Well, it's both because on the one hand, scientific materialism is trying to say that everything is made of the tiniest possible particles that explain all the larger things. And yet it also says that these things are mathematically knowable, which means, so they're tiny particles, which means undermining. They're smaller than everything we see. But they're also mathematically knowable, which means that we can exhaust the reality, the essential reality at least of those particles using mathematical equations. So they're not really mysterious in any way. There's nothing in them that's unknowable. And uh, I, I, when I first coined this term, I Googled it right away because I actually don't like coining completely new words. I like words with a historical basis to them. And it turns out that dual mining is already being used 
in the credit card industry, it refers to text mining and data mining somebody simultaneously. So it has this nice sinister uh, tone of surveillance about it that I like. And so they can understand everything about you just by text mining and data mining you. And I've actually heard, I've been told that credit cards can predict a divorce three years in advance with 70% accuracy. Have you heard this? Something about purchase patterns three years in advance. You might have no idea. They can predict your divorce three years in advance. It's somehow unsettling. All right. So that's one of the problems uh, I want to avoid in object-oriented ontology. Uh, undermining and overmining are, are two problems. The object has to be somewhere in between those two. The object is a kind of middle ground that can't be understood either in terms of its tiny parts or in terms of its outward effects. We're getting at something that's in between those two when we talk about an object, which is interesting because all forms of knowledge involve either undermining or, or overmining. And I mean this quite seriously, all forms of knowledge. If somebody asks you what something is, there are really only two kinds of answers you can give. You can tell them what it's made of, or you can tell them what it does with you know subtler variants on those two. And so if we're saying we're trying to avoid undermining and overmining, we're trying to get at an object without either of the two main forms of knowledge that exists. We're trying to get at the object without what we usually call knowledge at all. And that's what this lecture is about in a way. Are, are you left with nothing when you say we need something that's not knowledge to get at the things? Isn't philosophy supposed to be a form of knowledge? I'm going to address this topic shortly. Here's another problem I want to avoid. I call this literalism. And I define literalism as the belief that an object is nothing more than its qualities, right? That if you know all the properties of a thing, you know what it is. Uh, David Hume, uh, the great Scottish empiricist philosopher of the 1700s, used to say that an object is just a bundle of qualities. There's no object over and above all the properties that it has. And when we say object, that's just the nickname for all the qualities that we see going together frequently. So there is no object called an apple. There's just round, red, hard, cold, juicy, sweet, a certain price that it has in the market. All of these things are what we mean when we say apple. We don't mean something over and above that. That's literalism. And I'm against literalism for reasons I'm going to explain here. Uh, what are the problems of literalism? Well, uh, the main problem is that there's actually a gap between a thing and its qualities. Things only have their qualities in a loose sense. And Aristotle noticed this when he said that one of the definitions of a substance for him is a thing that can have different qualities at different times. So Socrates is sometimes happy, sometimes sad, sometimes asleep, sometimes awake. He's still Socrates. You can, and you too, and me too, and any object can have different qualities at different times. So there's a gap there. We both possess and do not possess our qualities. We can gain and lose qualities over time. Uh, Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology in the 20th century, uh, made this central to his philosophy when he said, if you are perceiving an object, you're always perceiving a specific number of its properties at once, right? You're perceiving an object from one side, not from all sides simultaneously. And so you're going around the object, you're seeing different profiles of it, move to different distances and from different angles, you're seeing the object differently at all times. So that you can't say that the object is equivalent to any particular set of its, its properties that we can observe. In fact, there's a gap between them. So we'll go back to Husserl in a second, but there are three problems as a reminder that I'm trying to get rid of in triple O. One of them is the idea that only the human world relation matters, that we can't talk about object-object relations, only the sciences can do that. I disagree with that. Uh, the idea of undermining and overmining and dual mining, that you have to reduce a thing in order to understand it. I'm saying that there's another way to understand it, that doesn't involve decomposing it into parts or embedding it in larger relations. And again, literalism, the idea that a thing is the same as its qualities. You can see object-oriented ontology as a way of trying to fight all three of these things at once and come up with a new model of how we experience the world. Okay, let's go back to Edmund Husserl, the founder of phenomenology in 1900, 1901 and his book, Logical Investigations. Later, the professor of Martin Heidegger, his very talented and rebellious star pupil. Uh, Husserl talks about, as I mentioned, the fact that you can see an object from different angles and distances and see different qualities of it at different times. He calls these adumbrations, um, different profiles of the thing, you could say. And the thing itself is always something other than that, right? Because you, you can see the thing in, under many different conditions and see it differently, and it's still the same object, even though its qualities are changing. Um, now, he also gets rid of uh, one of the other problems, the overmining problem, because he says the object has qualities that we don't 
uh, necessarily perceive, right? Because yes, you can view the apple from different angles and different distances. However, the apple has needs some qualities that stay the same in order to still be an apple, right? Because if it changed enough, you would say that's no longer an apple, it's just an apple core, or you would say, I misperceived it, it's actually a peach, I misperceived it from a distance. So there are certain basic core properties that the apple needs for us to consider it this very apple. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to be this apple, it's going to be something else. So there are actually two kinds of qualities, according to him. There's the kind that we, we perceive, and all of those are accidental, he says, because all of those can change. We see objects from different sides and angles all the time. Then he thinks your mind, your intellect can somehow intuit the properties that the, that the object needs in order to remain what they are, what it is. And he calls that categorical intuition. Now, I actually think that doesn't work. I don't think your intellect can do that any better than your, your senses can. My reason for thinking that is that both uh, your senses and your intellect relate to the thing. And when you relate to the thing, it's no longer the thing itself, right? The thing in itself is something more than any possible relation we can have to it. It's more than our senses see of it. It's also more than our intellect sees of it. I don't think you can gain a perfect intellectual model of an object any more than a perfect sensual perception of it. But what's interesting about Husserl is that he distinguishes between these two kinds of qualities. They're the kind that are uh, accidental and change, and then they're the kinds that stay the same. And those, for him, are accessible by the intellect. Okay, uh, what, what is his object about? You know, he talks about an object, like an apple, that stays the same, even as its various features are changing for the senses. He calls these intentional objects, and there's a historical tradition by this. It comes from medieval terminology. I call them sensual objects. Uh, not, not in the sense of the senses, but sensual in the sense that we have an immediate contact with them. They are directly present to us. Um, I see a computer here. It's, it's just this computer, right? Uh, I have a direct access to it, and its qualities are changing, but it remains the same computer for me. It has a certain durability in my experience of it. Okay. Um, he doesn't think there's any deeper thing than that. He doesn't think that there's a deeper object that our senses can't get the way Immanuel Kant does. Right. Immanuel Kant thinks these are these, there are these things in themselves that, that are out there and that cause our perception somehow, but we can never directly access them. Edmund Husserl thinks this is absurd, and the, I don't, but he, he thinks it's absurd. The reason he thinks it's absurd is he uses the example of Berlin. He says, if there's a, a Berlin, the city that I experience, and then there's a Berlin in itself that's out there somewhere, I could never have any knowledge about Berlin, right? Because there'd be this impossible gap between a real Berlin and a Berlin in my mind, and any statement I make would just be about things in my mind, knowledge would be impossible. And so he thinks there simply is no such thing as this hidden deep object behind the one that we see. All right. Well, um, anyway, the, the object that he has is one that I would call a sensual object. It's an object that's directly accessible to us, but it has these two kinds of qualities. One of those kinds of qualities is also directly accessible to us. Then there's the deeper qualities that the apple or whatever object needs to have in order to be what it is. He thinks you can get at that directly with your mind, not your senses, but I've made the case that you can't get at it with your mind any better because your mind is just another way of relating to the object and creating a model of it. And there's actually a real apple there that you could never quite exhaust with your mind or your senses. Okay, so let's turn now to Heidegger, his student. This is, I started my career writing about Heidegger. Uh, Martin Heidegger's most famous book, of course, is called Being in Time, published in 1927, one of the classics of 20th century philosophy, in many people's opinion. And there's a famous passage early in the book called The Tool Analysis. It's very interesting. And I have argued in my first book, which was my, my dissertation initially, that uh, this tool analysis is often misunderstood in a couple of ways. Well, what the tool analysis tells us is that when you're using things, you're usually taking them for granted. You're not noticing them. So the chair you're sitting in right now, you probably weren't noticing it until I mentioned it, right? It's, it's something there that you're relying on, taking for granted. You're not explicitly perceiving it, most likely. Uh, you would notice that if the legs collapse and the chair were to fall on the ground, or if there were an earthquake, which I shouldn't say since I'm in Long Beach, it could happen. Uh, hope I don't summon an earthquake. Um, so for the most part, when things are working well, they hide from us, they withdraw, they're not being used. He calls that the ready to hand. Then there's what he calls the present at hand. One of the main distinctions is in his philosophy, the present at hand is something that's explicitly present to us. Um, and that, so when something breaks, when a tool breaks or malfunctions, or if we just turn and notice it for some reason, 
it becomes present at hand. It becomes an individual thing in our consciousness. Now there's a tendency, even Heidegger himself, but also most of his commentators, treat this as the difference between practice and theory, right? So that the hammer when it's being used and is invisible is that's human practice and that's deeper than human theory or human perception, which are explicit. And again, similar to a point I made a few minutes ago, for me, I don't think this distinction goes deep enough because again, to use something is not to make any more direct contact with it than to perceive it or think about it. Because when you use a chair, are you really any closer to the chair than when you think about it? No, because your body is only making use of some properties of the chair, not others. It has many more properties that are irrelevant to human bodies. You know, mosquitoes can probably, or dogs can smell things that are in the chair that we can't. The, the chair has all of these hidden properties that the human sensorium and the human intellect, intellect cannot touch. And so our, practice, our practices are not really any closer than our, our theory is. And so there's actually something deeper than any human relation. Uh, in every object. And then I push that a step further, which is not tonight's theme. I say that when objects encounter each other, the same is true. And that's the part where people start saying I'm crazy, right? Because people are willing to say, yes, humans are finite. Humans can't understand everything in an object, but they tend to treat that as the special burden of humans or as the special burden of animal consciousness. It's strange to people to think that if two objects collide, they're not really unlocking each other's full reality either. But this, this is in fact what I think. Um, to use an example from medieval Islamic philosophy, which I enjoy, uh, when fire burns cotton, the fire is not interacting with all the properties of the cotton. It's oversimplifying the cotton. I'm not saying it's conscious of the cotton. I'm just saying that, that being finite and being conscious are not the same things, right? Those are two different properties of objects. The fact that two objects collide, when they causally interact, they're not causally interacting with all of each other's properties, only some. So objects oversimplify each other just as we oversimplify objects and as we oversimplify each other. That is simply the very nature of relations. Relations do not exhaust their terms, whether they're mental relations or purely causal relations between things. All right, but there's something else about Heidegger, uh, his analysis that I think is, is wrong too. And that is that Heidegger tends to describe tools when they're hidden and working as not individual, but as belonging to a total system. So that when, only when you perceive or when something breaks, Heidegger thinks, are, are objects individual objects. When they're working, they tend to work as a giant system where one tool supports another. So for example, my chair is supported by the floor. The floor is supported by the structure of this building. That's supported by the bedrock in Long Beach, California, and so on. So every tool relies on other tools. And so he says, uh, strictly speaking, there's no such thing as an equipment, as he puts it. There's no such thing as a a tool or an object ultimately, right? That when things are functioning as they are supposed to, they're all one gigantic holistic system. He calls it world. World is his term for that holistic system. Uh, and then he has a tendency to think that individual objects only exist when they break off derivatively from this whole. So there's kind of a holistic position underlying Heidegger's theory. And I think there's a problem with that too. Um, First of all, it creates this weird duality where the world, is, the world as a whole is one, and then somehow the human mind or animal perception is breaking it up into pieces. But there's an obvious contradiction there because if the world is really a whole, then I should be part of that whole too. Why is my human mind different enough from the whole that it's able to arbitrarily break the world into pieces and to see things as individuals? I say there has to be some prior individuality. The world has to be cut up into certain things uh, prior to our being able to do that. Uh, it can't just be something that the human mind has this godlike power to do. The world is already carved up into pieces. And this, this idea, this holistic idea goes way back in the history of philosophy, of course. It goes back to Anaxagoras, the pre-Socratic philosopher who thought the world was this lump, this aperon, and a mind began to think and it began to spin the aperon so rapidly, rotated so fast that it broke into pieces, and as a result, everything contains pieces of everything else. So your body contains pieces of sharks and trees and houses. It just has more pieces of you. And that's why you look like you instead of the other thing, other things. More recently, Emmanuel Levinas, famous French uh, post-World War II philosopher, in his, one of his early writings, which I love very much, uh, ex uh, Existence and Existence, translated by Alfonso Lingus, uh, says that the world, is a, world in itself is what he calls ilia, the French phrase for there is. And it's this kind of anonymous, single, rumbling thing that we can experience in insomnia, he says. When you can't fall asleep, 
seems like things all start bleeding together and nothing is anything definite and everything's kind of this giant hole that you can't turn off because you can't sleep. And ultimately he says, it's our mind that breaks things up into pieces and breaks things up into objects. And it's a beautiful uh, little book he wrote, um, quite poignantly in a prisoner of war camp in Nazi Germany during World War II. Uh, but I think it doesn't work. You need to have some prior uh, articulation of reality into beings in order for the human mind to be able to make any attempt to treat those individual beings at all. Okay, so uh, if I were doing PowerPoints tonight, I would show a diagram, sorry, that appears in many of my books, especially the quadruple object, which is uh, showing a fourfold structure of reality, which is a little different from Heidegger's own theory of the fourfold structure. But remember, I was saying that when you look at an apple, there's the apple as an object, there's also all the qualities of the apple, which are changing constantly. So that's a sensual object and sensual qualities. There's a tension between those because the apple needs some qualities, but it doesn't need any of those qualities in particular that you perceive because those can all be changed. You can paint the apple yellow, it's still the same apple. You can take a bite out of the apple, it's still the same apple. And so the apple has a certain independence from everything you perceive about it. That's one tension. And then you can say the same thing happens in reality itself, the reality itself that's hidden. I've just made a case that there have to be individual objects there too. It can't just be a whole like Heidegger thinks. It's hidden, but it also needs properties because if object, individual real objects didn't have properties or specific qualities, they'd all be the same. Everything will be the same. Every object has different qualities. And I just wanna say quickly, all of these points have a uh, precedent in the history of philosophy. There are four tensions, right? You have two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities. Real objects, sensual objects, the ones you, you can encounter. Real qualities, sensual qualities. So you have four different poles and there are four different possible kinds of object quality tension. And this, the research program of object-oriented ontology is to study those different tensions and see what happens when you cut, you make separations between those objects and their qualities. And I take historical precedents from three philosophers to get all of these, Edmund Husserl, Martin Heidegger, and Leibniz. Leibniz is the one who says early in his treatise, The Monadology, objects are all one, but they can't just be one because if they were all just one, they'd all be the same. And so an object must have individual qualities that makes it different from the others. Okay, now of these four tensions, two of them are most interesting to us tonight for the topic I've chosen. One of them is the kind I talked about in Husserl's case where you have an apple and are trying to figure out the real qualities of the apple that it needs to be what it is. Um, that, that's the tension that I would call knowledge. That's what we mean when we talk about knowledge. There's an object and we want to know what its qualities are. What are they? And Husserl thinks you can get those with your intellect. I don't think so. I think you have to get at those obliquely too uh, because you can never know exactly what the properties of an object are. You can, you can try to zero in on them, but that's the kind that we call knowledge. Then there's another one that gets uh, sidelined sometimes, which deals with the situation where you have a real object that's hidden with sensual qualities. And that covers cases that I would call aesthetic experience. And I'm gonna talk about this for a few minutes because this is pretty central to the theory. Um, normally what we get in the modern period is this idea that mathematics and the hard sciences, they're hard, they're tough. This is where really rigorous thinkers go. And then the humanities and the arts are kind of soft. You know, you get these kind of airy fairy people who to use the old expression who never have to be wrong because you can say anything you want in the humanities and the arts and no one is ever going to challenge you. That's kind of the caricature. And I would say uh, that that's, that's the wrong sort of caricature. What's going on is really something different because let's take art, for example, and I'm gonna apply this to philosophy in a second. Art is a kind of cognition. There's, there's no question that art gives you a certain sort of cognitive experience, but you wouldn't primarily call it knowledge. Um, if you go and look at an exhibition of Picasso's and you come out and says, uh, somebody, somebody asks, what did you learn from this Picasso show? It's hard to think of any prose statements you could make that wouldn't sound silly. Like I saw Guernica and I learned that the Spanish civil war was very bad and brutal. That's kind of a strange, I mean, yes, that, that's communicated by the painting of Guernica and the bo horrible bombing that took place by the Luftwaffe there. But that's not really, you're not going to Picasso to learn about the Spanish Civil War. You can do that better from a history book. You're having an, an aesthetic experience that draws on your, your awareness of the Spanish Civil War. Something else is going on. It's not a kind of knowledge. You cannot paraphrase an artwork is what many critics would say. 
Paraphrase is impossible because paraphrase involves undermining or overmining a thing, talking about what it means. And you can never replace, say, a painting or a musical composition with a one-page prose statement or even 10-page prose statement of what it means. You have to experience it. Imagine a book of, say, Cezanne paintings that had no illustrations in it. Somebody was just trying to describe what all the paintings look like. This would be very difficult. I mean, it'd be a challenging exercise in writing, but you need to be able to ultimately have an experience of the painting itself. So art is not literal in that case. I often talk about the case of metaphor. Uh, I've written about this in my book, Object Oriented Ontology, A New Theory of Everything and Elsewhere. What goes on in metaphor? Well, there's a couple of things about, about metaphors that I wanna say. The first one is that metaphors can't be too close to a literal statement or too far from a literal statement. So if you say a pen is like a pencil, that's not really a metaphor unless it's some genius Dadaist poet who's able to make that work somehow. Uh, for the most part, that's a failed metaphor. A pen is like a pencil. It's a literal description because what you're thinking of is that the shape is similar, the function of a pen and a pencil is similar. It's just a literal identity. It's not a metaphor. You also can't make it too far from a literal statement. If I say a, a pen is like a chocolate milkshake with a shot of mint, that's a, that it's too far from literal to have any effect on you at all, right? You need that. There needs to be some resemblance, uh, but not too much of a resemblance. So what do we get in the case of a real metaphor? Well, I mentioned it can't be too literal or too far from literal. The other thing is it can't be reversible. In a, in a literal statement, I can say a pen is like a pencil or a pencil is like a pen. It doesn't make a difference. It doesn't make a difference which one comes first. You can reverse them because you're just comparing the qualities of the two and saying that the qualities are similar. Metaphor, you can't do that. So if you look at Homer's famous metaphor from the Odyssey, where he calls the Mediterranean Sea, the wine dark sea. Well, in the first place, that's not entirely literalizable because he's not just saying the sea is pretty much the same wavelength of light as wine. There's a little more than that, right? He's also hinting at the intoxication of the wine and making the sea intoxicating, making it dangerous in the way that wine can be dangerous, making people lose their inhibitions. Uh, so it's, a, it's using the somewhat literal identity of color between the wine and the sea to suggest the identity with all these other properties that is very hard for us to imagine literally, that, that the sea has all these wine-like properties. Now imagine that instead, uh, Homer were talking about wine and called it sea dark wine. That's still a metaphor that works pretty well, but it's not the same metaphor, right? Because now the wine is the subject and the wine has all these sea properties like depth and being filled with sea monsters, maybe having wrecks on the bottom or tre buried treasures in the wine. Uh, so it's, it's also a metaphor, but it's not reversible. Okay, now what also happens in metaphor? What happens in metaphor, I claim, is that when you talk about a wine dark sea, the qualities of the wine are still somewhat accessible. We kind of have some idea what the wine properties are, the color, the wine darkness, but then the sea becomes inaccessible because we can't literally imagine what a wine-like sea would be like. It becomes somehow mysterious in a way that the literal sea is not. The, the real sea becomes something out of our grasp. It becomes something like a thing in itself. Okay, now uh, since, this is another thing I don't have time to explain, but you can't have an object without qualities or qualities without an object. You always have an object with qualities. It's a phenomenological principle that I accept. For that reason, if the object, the sea disappears, there has to be another object that takes the wine properties. And my argument is that is I myself as the reader of the poetry, or I myself as the perceiver of the painting. I have to perform the object that vacates the scene, that becomes inaccessible. I become the thing in itself. I become the support of the wine dark properties. And this is why I claim that aesthetic experience has this emotional impact in a way that literal statements do not, however important and informative they can be. What's powerful about aesthetic statements is that they necessarily deploy us as actors in the creation of the artwork. And I talk about that in Object Oriented Ontology book as well. So this is what's happening in, in metaphor, I say. Now, I'm gonna say something now that's a little more controversial which is that uh, I said that art is not literal and that's not so controversial. Critics have said that. Uh, I'm gonna say now that philosophy is also not literal in a certain sense. Uh, that philosophy is a little closer to the aesthetic side in some ways than it is to the side of literal knowledge, which is strange because you probably think of philosophy as a, a kind of knowledge, a very general kind of knowledge. Philosophy aspires in the modern period to be more exact like mathematics or the natural sciences. Uh, 
However, if you remember what, what philosophia means, the original Greek word, philosophia means love of wisdom. It doesn't mean wisdom. The reason for this is that Socrates says only a god can have knowledge or wisdom, right? A human cannot. A human can get closer to it. We are never going to be able to get it directly. The people who say they can are the sophists, Sophia, right? The sophists. The philosopher is one who knows they can't get it directly. And so there's something uh, kind of counter knowledge about philosophy, even though we associate it with knowledge. We wouldn't think of philosophy as an art, but there's something art like about it. Um, now, there's another piece of evidence here, which is that. Uh, I talked about the emotional impact in arts because you have to perform the artwork to a certain extent. Well, there's also a sense in which philosophy, especially in the East, even more than in Western philosophy has been seen as a way of life and not just as a theory, not just as a doctrine or a literal statement about how the world is, but it's also a way of life that you pursue. And you don't necessarily just have to go to Indian philosophy for this or other Eastern philosophies because uh, this has come into Western philosophy in cases such as Kierkegaard and Nietzsche this tradition, or Pascal, this tradition that Alain Badiou, the French philosopher, calls anti-philosophy, which doesn't mean a rejection of philosophy. It means a kind of philosophy that in a way is not just about having certain theories, but is about embracing a philosophical theory and making it your life, making it guiding everything you uh, do by that theory. So for example, Pascal's wager, he doesn't give a proof for the existence of God. He says, if God doesn't exist and you believe in him, no loss. But if God exists and you don't believe in him, big loss, you're in trouble. So make yourself a, a Catholic, right? Or in Kierkegaard's case, you know, Hegel's system can say all these things, but ultimately you have to make a choice. Are you going to be a Christian or not? And in Nietzsche's case, um, it's not just the question of the literal things Nietzsche says. Not only is he a great poetic writer, he also lived a certain life. He tried to avoid academic philosophy, which he disliked. And You've got Wittgenstein, you've got these other figures who are anti-philosophers, and Badiou himself. Badiou himself says there is no truth without fidelity to the truth. I don't know how well people know Badiou's philosophy in this audience, but he talks about how there are four kinds of truth. They're in uh, politics, art, science, and love. And truth exhibits itself through an event that ruptures with the previous situation. You glimpse a truth, you fall in love, or you commit yourself to a scientific revolution that's happening or a political revolution. And you commit yourself to it no matter what. Everything else has to fall in line with that event rather than the reverse. And so you're committing yourself to an event. It's a very Kierkegaardian sort of philosophy, even though Badiou is a rationalist who loves mathematics. He's very interested in committing yourself to a surprising truth event that happens. Well, there's a sense in which philosophy has some of that, right? Um, it's hard to separate a philosophical doctrine from your life. It's one of the reasons this is a difficult profession. You never really have time off, right? But my fellow philosophers here know that. Your, your philosophy questions stick with you day and night, uh, whereas certain other fields, you kind of have downtime. You leave the lab and you've, you can watch television and not, not think about chemistry or whatever it is you work on. Philosophy kind of seeps everywhere. All right, so um, I've tried to say that there are two related but different kinds of cognitive experience and. I've roughly called them aesthetic and literal. The aesthetic is where there's a big gap between the real object, which is hidden, and the sensual qualities that you can experience. Whereas the literal is where you have a, a sensual object in front of you and the real qualities are there and you can never get them exactly, but you're trying to get them. So these are two diagonally crossed ways of dealing with the world. What's the relation between these? Are they totally different or is there some relation between them? Because it makes it, I'm making it sound now like art and science have nothing to do with each other Philosophy is on the art side. It's not a kind of knowledge at all. But that's an exaggeration, of course. There's got to be some way they come together. And that's what I'm going to, to turn to now. But let me add one other point about what I've just been saying. Uh, realism. Realism, which the, the view roughly that um, uh, there's a world outside the mind, whether you think it or not. That's the way it's usually defined. And often, it's often the case that people who are committed to realism and philosophy also think not only is there a real world out there, but we can know it if we follow certain procedures, usually scientific ones are the recommended ones. This is how we gain a knowledge of reality. And so most realists are fighting against relativism. They're trying to fight the idea that any perspective is just as good as any other. We're going to show that there's a knowledge about the world that you can obtain. And some of my friends, uh, I, I should point out that in the continental tradition, which I come from, realism has been frowned upon for the past century. It's considered kind of a the question of whether realism is true or not has been seen as kind of gauche and kind of a pseudo problem. 
right? That we're kind of beyond that. We're already, just by experiencing, we're already out in the world, seeing things and interacting with things. So it's not really a problem, whether the world exists or not independently of us. Well, uh, continental tradition in the last 20 years uh, has been taking the realism problem more seriously. And a couple of my friends, Maurizio Ferraris in Italy and Marcus Gabriel in Germany, uh, follow forms of realism. They call it the new realism. And the new realism means that they think there are certain specified methods you can follow uh, to, to get at reality as it is. They're not, it's new in their view because they're not committed to science as the master discourse. They think that there are other discourses that are just as valid as science, but they do think there's a truth you can know. I, however, think relativism is a smaller danger than what I call idealism. And where does idealism come from? You might think of idealism as the idea that nothing exists outside the mind, and that's not many people have thought anything that extreme, Barclay maybe, uh, in modern philosophy. What, what idealism really is to me is the idea that there's an, an overlap possible between the thought and its object. I see that as a kind of, of idealism. Why? Because, well, I will first start by saying something that you might think is irrelevant. I'm going to start by saying that perfect knowledge of a thing is not the same as the thing itself. So let's say you could have a perfect mathematical model of a dog. That perfect model would still not be a dog, of course, right? It would not bark. It would not eat. It would just be your perfect knowledge of a dog. It would be in your mind or in a computer or wherever it is, a piece of paper. There's a difference then between the, the uh, model of the dog and the dog or the model of anything and the thing, a planet or whatever it is. Now, a lot of times people say, so what? Everybody knows that. No one has ever thought that the knowledge of a thing is the same as the thing. In fact, my book, Object-Oriented Ontology, received a critical review in the London Review of Books from Stephen Mulhall, professor at Oxford, who said I was setting up this bizarre criterion that you can't have knowledge of a thing without becoming that thing, which makes it sound like a silly theory, right? In order to know a dog, I'd have to become a dog, which is not what I think. What I was trying to say is that no knowledge can ever be the thing. It's still knowledge but there's a gap between the two. There's always a gap between knowledge and the thing. And what is that gap? Most people have an implicit assumption about what that gap is. And that implicit assumption is that the difference between a perfect model of the dog and the dog itself is that the dog is in matter. And my knowledge is somehow extracted from the dog and brought into my mind without the matter coming into my mind. You can find this in Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas in different ways, that we somehow extract forms from the matter and bring it into our minds. And that's what knowledge is. Well, one problem with this is that, and this is going to sound extreme, but I don't think there's any reason to believe that something called matter exists. In fact, I think the concept of a thing called matter was invented just to support this idea that there's a form in hearing in something that you can pull out and bring into your mind without bringing the thing into your mind. We, we can never find a thing called matter that has no form. Wherever we look, there's a form. And if, the, if there's, you know, Kant talks about the imaginary coins in my mind and the real coins in the world, I would say that's because the forms are different, right? The, the coins in my mind have different forms than the coins in the world. That anything that's brought from the world into my mind undergoes a translation. Just like if you translate Shakespeare from English to German or any, any other language, you can create a reasonable analogy to the original text, but you can't totally replicate it in a new language. It's gonna be something slightly different. There's gonna be some loss of form, maybe some gain of form also, maybe some improvements happen in translation. Sometimes books sound better in foreign translation, as you know. All right, so um, that's another part of this triple O theory, that any movement of a form from one place to another requires translation. And that causes problems for the conception of knowledge. And that's, we're gonna to turn to that now, which is what the, the lecture is ultimately about. Uh, my, my title is uh, Justified Untrue Belief which was meant to be a little shocking for philosophers because quite often knowledge is defined as justified true belief. And why do they add the word justified? Why don't we just say knowledge is true belief? Well, the reason is you can be, you can have true belief by accident, right? You can say, uh, in one of Plato's dialogues, they say, which way is the road to Larissa, city in Northern Greece? You might accidentally find the right road to Larissa without being able to tell anybody. Just by choosing a random fork in the road, you end up in Larissa. That's true belief, but it's not knowledge. You believe that the left fork in the road was the right road to Larissa, but it wasn't knowledge because you couldn't explain it, right? And so that's why justified is usually added. You can't just be right by a lucky guess. You also have to give reasons. And that's why reasons and arguments are often so often demanded in philosophy. That you can't just assert things and get right, uh, become right by luck. Well, there was a famous article in 1963 by a guy named Edmund Gettier 
it's a very famous article. It's also the only article he ever published in his life, and it's only three pages, but it made him famous. And he tried to say in this article why justified true belief isn't enough. And he, I'll, I'll tell you quickly one of his examples. One of his examples is, let's say Justin and I are both applying for the same job. And the, the supervisor has already called me and said, uh, sorry, just got to tell you this in advance. We're going to hire Justin instead. And I say, oh, too bad. And I also happen to know, because Justin and I are friends, and he was over at my house for coffee this morning, that he has exactly 10 coins in his pockets, because I counted them for some reason. I know he has 10 coins in his pocket. So I have this belief that the person who will be hired has 10 coins in his pocket. Okay. Now, it turns out that after I talk, talked to the supervisor, they changed their mind and decided to hire me instead. And it turns out I also, by chance, have 10 coins in my pocket. And so it's, my, my belief was, was justified and true. I was justified in thinking that the person who would be hired had 10 coins in his pocket, but I was totally wrong about who it was, right? I got hired with 10 coins in my pocket rather than Justin. So you wouldn't want to call that knowledge, even though it was justified true belief. That's one of Gettier's points. Okay, it's interesting in itself, and there's been a, you know, thousands of responses to that in the last 60 years, but I want to, I want to approach it from a different angle. Um, I'm going to say that no belief can be both justified and true that justified and true in a way work at cross purposes. Because of what I've said, right? That what I've called the aesthetic experience is the one that we would call true. How so? Well, if I am having an aesthetic experience when seeing a specific painting or hearing a specific piece of music, obviously somebody can criticize my taste. Somebody can say, you're having an aesthetic experience listening to Justin Bieber and not when listening to Mozart, you have horrible taste. And they might be right in saying that. But if I'm having the aesthetic experience listening to Justin Bieber, I'm having it, right? That is, that cannot be, as long as I know what aesthetic experience means under this definition, no one can take that away from me. Even if it's aesthetically blameworthy that I'm having that experience, I'm having it. There's a kind of truth to that experience. I'm having a, an aesthetic experience with Bieber that is not literal. It's putting me into this aesthetic mindset somehow, or the same when seeing a painting. Even if it's not justified, it's, I'm just telling you, hey, that's, I'm telling you, I don't like Mozart and I like Justin Bieber. No justification, that's just how I feel. Okay, um, the same can also be true for philosophy in its, in its aesthetic dimension. If I've accepted Pascal's wager or I've accepted Kierkegaard's call to Christianity, again, someone can criticize me for that. Someone can say, you know, what a, that's, why are you criticizing yourself or committing yourself to Christianity? It's false and they argue with me. Yeah, they can, they can have an argument about that. They can argue about whether or not that experience is justified on other grounds, but they can't take away the fact that I have committed myself to Christianity in a Kierkegaardian sense and it's transformed how I see my world, right? There's a certain truth in that, even if it's not justified. Um, how, on the other hand, what we call the literal register can be justified, but it can never be true. Why not? Because I've already argued that any scientific model or any model of any kind is going to be a translation of what's in the world. And so it can be justified. There can be all kinds of reasons why I believe Einstein rather than Newton, good reasons, yet it's never going to be a direct encounter with gravity in itself. There's no scientific theory that can do that. And this is what we call fallibilism. I'd say fallibilism rather than skepticism. I know a lot of your series is about skepticism, but you know, it's fallibilism, this idea that, that my theories could be proven wrong. Now I wanna talk about two variants of this quickly. Uh, Karl Popper is famous, of course, for his definition of a scientific statement as being one that's falsifiable. Um, that you, um, if you make a statement, if there's no possible evidence that could falsify it, it's not a scientific statement. And Popper doesn't like Marxism or psychoanalysis. So he gives those as examples of unscientific because he claims there's nothing that can happen in history that will prove that Marx is right. And there is nothing that can happen on the psychiatrist's couch that proves that Freud is right. They can always change their theory retroactively to fit any anomalies. And so it's not really scientific. That's, that's Popper's complaint. And so in Popper, that undergirded two things. One of them was a kind of catastrophic sense of experiments, right? That one experiment can lay waste to an entire scientific theory by disproving it. And it also uh, undergirded a commitment to democracy because Popper thought that democracy was the open society in which all beliefs can be tested. So he plot Plato was an authoritarian and Hegel, these guys are not, they're committed to a closed society. They should be shunned. Now, but there's an interesting variation on Popper's theory, a strong variation made by Imre Lakatos, his one-time disciple, the Hungarian philosopher of science who died pretty young, unfortunately, in the early 70s. 
uh, what he said about Popper's theory is he, he was very impressed by Popper, but he said the problem with Popper's theory is that all theories are always already falsified. Every theory already has falsifying evidence. And he claims, I haven't counted this myself, he claims that Newton's theory of gravity, which was dominant from the late 1600s until 1919, when Einstein replaced it, had 200, around 200 anomalies. There were around 200 problems, at, le at least, let's say, with, with Newton's theory of gravity that people couldn't solve. And yet people didn't throw out Newton's theory the way Popper would have predicted, right? Why not? Because it worked so well on many other things. And there wasn't a better theory available. So of course you're going to keep following Newton's theory. And it wasn't until Einstein's theory of gravity came along that there was reason to abandon Newton's theory for it. So when was it replaced? Not because Newton was suddenly falsified, but because there was suddenly a strong verifying instance of Einstein's theory, which was the Einstein's theory predicts that uh, starlight coming close to the sun should be bent by the gravitational uh, distortion of space. And of course, usually we can't see this because you can't see stars near the sun. The sun is too bright. So of course you have to wait for a total solar eclipse, which is what they did. The first total solar eclipse after Einstein published his theory was observed by Sir Arthur Stanley Eddington. And he did the measurements and found that in fact, the starlight was displaced by the amount predicted by Einstein's theory. And that was the moment when Einstein became a household name around the globe. It wasn't because of falsifications of Newton's theory. It was because of a strong verifying instance of Einstein's theory, predicting something that it had no reason to predict. Uh, and there were a couple other examples of that. One had to do with the shifting position of the perihelion of Mercury, and the other had to do with the prediction of black holes, which Einstein himself didn't figure out. It was another theorist who figured out that Einstein's theory would entail the existence of black holes. So that's what a strong theory will do, according to Lakatosh. It will, it will predict things that nobody would have expected that are then somehow verified theoretically or experimentally. So it looks like Lakatosh brings us full circle from Popper's falsificationism back to the older verificationism that it replaced. So what this is an example of is how debates in the philosophy of science often raise the problem of how can knowledge in science be both true and subject to revolutionary upheaval. It's a very interesting problem. How can Newton be both right and then later wrong? His theory worked so well and then suddenly it was replaced by Einstein's theory. Of course, one way of doing this is known as structural realism in the philosophy of science. And this is the idea that it's, um, there's a certain invariant mathematical core that stays the same in Newton's theory and in Einstein's. So somehow mathematics had a partial direct grasp of the truth even though there are revolutions after revolutions in physics and other sciences. This won't work for Lakatos though, because he doesn't see mathematics that way. He also has a fallibilist conception of mathematics that we don't have to go into, but he thinks mathematics also isn't that different from natural science. It doesn't give you direct access to the truth, that it can also be falsified, that mathematical proofs can also be falsified in ways that most of us don't expect. And of course for triple O, this won't work because mathematics is a form of overmining and it can't give us direct access to reality in the way that, for example, my friend Quentin Mayasu thinks, another speculative realist, who thinks that mathematics gives us direct access to the primary qualities of the world. So what does scientific knowledge give us? And I don't have an answer for that tonight, but I have a couple of, of things to add to the discussion. Since Lakatos thinks that all scientific theories are inevitably false, he replaces the difference between true and false with a, a difference between what he calls progressive and degenerating research programs. I should have said something about research programs. Uh, he says, uh, it doesn't matter how many individual statements or predictions of Newton are false because you're still committed to the Newtonian program, the Newtonian research program, unless a better program appears that convinces you that it's better. And so it, it doesn't matter that there were 200 anomalies of Newton's theory. There was nothing better. And people assume maybe we'll figure out those anomalies in the future. Newton's theory is so powerful. Let's stick with it, see what happens. And then Einstein totally reconceives what gravity is. And eventually the tide turns and people are Einsteinians rather than Newtonians. And eventually, since Einstein can't unify relativity with quantum theory, there eventually is going to be some new theory and Einstein will be part of history rather than the up-to-date theorist of gravity that he is now, most likely. So, um, Lakatos says you have to think instead about progressive and degenerating. And he, he, tries, he doesn't necessarily explain this uh, adequately, but he, he takes some steps along this path. One example I've already, we've already talked about, which is that progressive theories can predict things sometimes without even realizing it. And so they're not just making ad hoc 
tailoring of their formulae to fit what we already know. They're not just adjusting their theory so that it fits things that have already happened. They're also entailing that certain things will happen that no one has ever tested. And then they test them like the eclipse with Einstein's theory. It turns out Einstein was right. So they make uh, predictions about things that are not yet known. So they're expanding. Whereas degenerating theories tend to simply take all counter evidence and explain it away by adding special um, heterosparibus conditions or, or, or uh, make ad hoc adaptations of the theory to things that happen. So think of the QAnon theory, for example, which I doubt anyone would call scientific anyway. But the point, the first, I mean, I never liked it, but the first point when I laughed out loud is you might remember the QAnon theory said, actually, Biden will never be inaugurated. Don't worry, Trump will be inaugurated. We'll be inaugurated. And then when it turned out a couple of days before Biden was getting ready to be inaugurated, they said, actually, it's Trump and he's transplanted Biden's face. I don't know if you heard that one. So you, they're just making absurd adaptations of the theory so that they don't have to give up the original ridiculous theory. That's an easy example of a theory that is degenerating. When none of Q's predictions come true, they have to keep uh, adding new conditions and new fanciful theories. You know, the guy goes to the pizzeria because Hillary Clinton is doing child sex abuse in the basement. Oh, there, there's no basement? Oh, it's some other pizza parlor somewhere. We just don't know which one yet. These are examples of degenerating theories and there are much tougher examples of, of real scientific theories that can degenerate, that people hang on to even after they're simply limping along after reality rather than pushing forward. Okay. Um, whether or not you agree with Popper and Lakatos about Marxism and psychoanalysis, Lakatos also rejected both of those. It's pretty harsh about both. There's still an interesting possibility here. The possibility is that even though every theory is in some sense false, some false theories are more progressive than the other. And so they're, they're sending us down the right path. And, and an important criterion of progressiveness, he tells us, is the ability to unify things that used to be distinct. And we can add to divide things that were once thought to be unified. He doesn't say that, but that's also true. So an example, uh, Newton realized that motions on the earth, like you drop an object and it falls, and the orbiting of the moon around the earth, which used to be thought as part of two separate realms of physics, right? There were terrestrial laws of physics and there were celestial laws where everything moves in a perfect circle around the earth. Newton was the one who said, no, that's the one and the same force. Gravity is making things fall on the ground and making things orbit each other in space. One and the same theory. And of course, that has been preserved when we move from Newton's theory to Einstein's. That hasn't been abandoned. So there are certain, there is a certain part of Newton that we keep, and it's not, not so much mathematical as it is conceptual. The idea of unifying things on the earth and things in the sky in one general theory of physics. Or Maxwell putting together electricity and magnetism, and then eventually realizing that light must be a form of magnet, electromagnetism because it moves at the same speed. We haven't given that up, even after Einstein, right? We still think of electromagnetism and light as all the same phenomenon underneath. But we also sometimes need to realize that things that we thought were one are actually multiple. And the example I thought of for that is there was a brief period during past Louis Pasteur's lifetime when it looked as if bacteria might explain all illness and you could give people vaccinations for all illness. It took until 1892 before viruses were discovered. And so that's a different kind of cause for illness. And then later parasites were discovered in tropical medicine as another source of illness. So now we know that there are at least three different root causes of illness. There might be others too, but uh, bacteria, viruses, and parasites can all be different forms of cause of illness. So that's another example of a progressive research program. You're, you're dividing things that used to be thought one and the same. So the ability for a theory to unify and divide the world in new ways is a transformative power. And this clearly has something to do with justification, but not with truth. Right. Truth would be, I, I've already associated truth with aesthetic experiences, with direct experiences of the thing itself, because you're creating the aesthetic object as you're performing it, as you're experiencing it, which you cannot do when you're trying to gain knowledge of the world. That's always a translation of a form, never a direct contact with it. Now, what about philosophy? Uh, I've tried to argue that philosophy has an aesthetic side. Uh, Emerson says somewhere, you know, philosophers are always told to give arguments, but Emerson says somewhere, who cares about Spinoza's arguments? Spinoza's philosophy is just interesting and we don't care how we really got to it. He has this interesting idea that the whole universe is God. It's all one substance. And then everything else is either an attribute or a mode of this substance. And whether his arguments are good or not for that might not be as important as the fact that he came up with that theory at all. That might be what fascinates many people. But we, we resist this in philosophy because we like to give arguments, right? We don't just like to posit theories and demand that people believe them. We like to have theories that are somewhat justified. Um, in philosophy, 
I'm sorry, in science, there's a kind of truth, exper uh, truth experience, which is the experiment. The experiment of Eddington measuring the, the sunlight, the, uh, the starlight being deflected by the sun. So there's that kind of aesthetic core <coughs> in, in science. It's, it's uh, there also in aesthetics in the sense that um, aesthetics can fail. In architecture, I teach in an architecture school. What is an example of aesthetic failure? Well, an example would be when a competition committee rejects your design, which happens to most designs, you don't get the commission. However, uh, in the case of the Sydney Opera House, one of the most globally popular works, uh, Jorn Utzon's design was originally in the trash before Eero Saarinen on the jury pulled it out and said, this is gonna be one of the world's great buildings, right? And I see Enrique shaking his head. You're not a fan of the building? Ah, okay. Uh, anyway, um, let me add one more consideration to the mix. Manuel de Landa, a continental philosopher of a Deleuzian inspiration, wrote a book called Philosophical Chemistry, an interesting book where he took chemistry textbooks 50 years apart, 1700, 1750, 1800, so on, and tried to look at the changes at 50 year increments. And he decided that for a, a good theory needs to be improvable, which I, I like that idea, that if a theory is totally polished and improvable, no one's drawn in to work on it, right? You need to have some rough edges for a theory to be interesting, which, which is, is inspiring because you think a theory should be polished and finished in order to be a good one. But actually, if you want to draw followers and people who adapt your theory, it's better to be a little rough around the edges so that people have to come in and fix some of your paradoxes for you and develop it. I think, for example, of Kant's. Uh, in Kant, there's this paradox that the, the thing in itself is supposed to be outside of us and cause our perceptions, but cause and effect is supposed to be uh, a feature of our understanding, not of the world in itself. So that's a paradox. And that led the German idealists on a different path. Um, so I would also say that there is a sense clearly in which scientific science and mathematics make progress. And although I wouldn't say art and philosophy make progress in the same way, you wouldn't want to totally discount progress in those fields either. And let me give you an art example. There's a nice book on classical music by Charles Rosen called The Classical Style where he tries to define the classical style as opposed to the Baroque or the Romantic. And he says it's essentially a matter of setting up dramatic harmonic tensions that are then resolved. And he traces the development of that style from Haydn through Mozart to Beethoven. And uh, that at least suggests, if he's right, that a musical style can be progressive, right? That Haydn somehow opened something up that had possibilities that Mozart and Beethoven were then able to, to flesh out more. And then eventually it reaches a point of saturation where there's nothing more to be done in the classical style and it turns into the romantic style, which he has a different definition of. Okay. Um, I mentioned black holes. I'm about to end here. I realize, I think I'm on, a, I'm on an hour and two minutes now, I'm sorry. I started at 7.08. Um, it's now thought that at the center of every galaxy, there's a supermassive black hole and back, black holes are somewhat paradoxical because no information comes out of them. We, don't, we can't see inside of them. We know something about what they are, but we can't detect them directly, only indirectly. I would say that at the heart of any theory, there should be a paradox. Uh, Count York is quoted in Heidegger's Being in Time as saying paradox is the mark of truth. And a paradox is inherently something non-literal because you can't literalize a paradox. Both a thing and its opposite are true in a paradox. And so you have to integrate them somehow. In mathematics, Georg Cantor ran across the paradox that there's no greatest infinity. And he said, I can see it, but I don't believe it. And it eventually led to mental illness in his case when not enough of his colleagues would accept it. So it was a paradox with grave personal consequences. And in Kant and in Heidegger and in any really transformative philosopher, you can usually find something paradoxical at the center that their successors have to deal with. That doesn't mean that paradox is the mark of knowledge because it's paradoxes are what you're trying to resolve when you're amassing knowledge. It does mean that paradox is the origin of the search for knowledge. And so this is why I would wanna end by saying philosophy is not simply aesthetic as I suggested at the beginning. It's also an attempt to ad adapt justifications or arguments as a response to a central paradox that can never really be addressed. And I'll stop there since I've gone a little over, hour and four minutes. Thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for that, Graham. Um, so we have uh, some time for questions for those who are um, <laughs> for those who are willing and um, interested. So, uh, does anyone want to pose a question for our speaker? I I have a question, and also Deborah, maybe Deborah, you want to talk first? 
Well, thank you, Graham, for this uh, very interesting talk and and um, uh, for sharing your your interest in Justin Bieber. Uh, no, I don't. That was hy <laughs> hypothetical. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I was, I'm trying to follow, I, I, I'm not familiar with, with your, with your theory, uh, but I'm trying to follow here what you were saying and, <clears throat> uh, understanding, uh, what you were saying about aesthetic experience mm -hmm. and, 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 and all these, these forms of, of expression, I think art offers us with, uh, embodiment of the experience, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> so can we say, uh, that to some extent art can be some form of a strong theory along the lines that you were mentioning in relation to Heidegger and, and, and the experiences and, and, and um, well, aesthetic experience. First, I wanna start by saying for some reason, my Zoom was frozen on Enrique the whole time. So it's like I was addressing him personally the whole time. And so I, I have a very good sense of the parts he wasn't convinced by, because I saw him shaking his head at a couple of points. <laughs> I'll try to take that in mind, uh, bear that in mind in my response. Yeah, uh, I, I, I forgive uh, Karl Popper and, and, and Lakatos. For, for not liking Marxism and psychoanalysis, yeah. Um, okay, I would say one of the differences is that art is creating objects rather than interpreting them. You can also interpret artworks, maybe even at the moment you're creating them, but I would say that's a subsequent act. You're producing something new. Because by the view of art that I outlined, it's not an object independent from us. It's a hybrid object formed of the art object and the experiencer. You know, in, in literary criticism, this is known as reader response theory. Um, I've tried to exp expand this theory to painting a bit in a different way. That you, you Michael Fried doesn't think painting should be theatrical. He thinks the painting painting should have nothing to do with the beholder. I think the beholder has to interact with the painting and it forms a kind of hybrid object made of both. And so a new object is actually being created. And every beholder, every interpreter is in a sense creating a new art object. Whereas this isn't so much what you're doing with a theory, right? With a theory, you're, you think of yourself as giving a new interpretation of something that exists independently in the world. You don't necessarily think of yourself as, as a part of the object you're theorizing. I mean, there may be a sense in which you realize that your historical biases and your cultural background influence how you see gravity or something like that. But um, there's an attempt in a theory to point at something independently uh, of our experience rather than trying to create the experience itself, the aesthetic experience. So I would say that's the sense in which art is not like a theory. And I would say that philosophy ends up straddling the line. It ends up being a kind of theory and art simultaneously. Thank you. Yeah. Deborah, did you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. So I really enjoyed your talk. And okay. I really enjoyed the fact that you present things in the way that I fear that potentially my students always experience me presenting things, which is sort of in like a melange and you sort of go from one place to the other, but eventually get to your point. So that's really lovely. And I wanted to sort of set up my question in the same kind of way. So right now, I'm actually, some of my students are here. I teach philosophy of science right now and also modern philosophy. And literally we're teaching, I'm, I'm teaching Spinoza right now. So I actually was making a lot of hand waving when you were talking about Spinoza because Spinoza is awesome. I do wonder why you don't use more Spinoza, but that's beside the point. Um, but so, you know, so I've got Spinoza on board, right? And I've also got philosophy of science and things like that. But, you know, I do a, I do a lot of post-analytic feminist philosophy. And so from my perspective, um, I'm frequently thinking about things texturally, relationally, in an embodied sense, which right. goes against a lot of the same kinds of things I think that you're opposing a lot of what you're, you're thinking about. Right. Um, but when you started talking about progressive theories, um, I began to wonder about why you would suppose that um, theories ought to be progressive. You've deconstructed space, right? But a progressive, to, to think of theories as progressive means to necessarily understand them within a context of a sort of temporal sequence. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering why that would be something you would go towards when everything else seems to be sort of abhorring that kind of order. Right. Um, one thought I have about that is that um, the sequence of arts and philosophies is not necessarily reversible uh, in the sense that um, through Picasso, you can understand past painting in a new light, but I'm not sure that the people in the Italian Renaissance could have experienced Picasso as art, right? They might've just seen it as nonsense, 
childish drawings. It's quite possible um, since they were focused on perspective and the accurate depiction of objects in three-dimensional space. Sometimes you have to go through the intervening steps and that's the sense in which, prog in which it's progressive. The, the Kant leads to Fichte and Fichte leads to Schelling and Schelling leads to Hegel. The reverse order is hard to imagine. Um, and this is also why often the first people in the series in these movements have a hard time understanding the later people in the series. So you've got that anecdote of Picasso making fun of Jackson Pollock, even though Jackson Pollock took a lot for Picasso and, and Kant putting out that letter saying Fichte's theory is nonsense, even though Fichte took his theory by expanding part of Kant's. So that's why I think that is a, an asymmetrical sequence. That's the sense in which it would be progressive. You can go from Newton's theory to Einstein's theory. It wouldn't make much sense to go from Einstein's theory back to Newton's because it's becoming smaller. It's, it's covering less, fewer cases. So that's, that's the way I would handle that. Uh, can I say something about the relational point? Because you mentioned relationality and feminism, and this is very interesting because this comes up a lot. A lot of feminisms these days take a relational approach. And I also argue in favor of essentialism, which is anathema to most feminisms. However, I wanna say something about that. I don't think the problem with essentialism is the idea that things have essences. I think it's the idea that we can know the essences. So for example, Edward Said in Orientalism, what he's really complaining about is the idea that Western powers think they can describe the essence of what he calls the Oriental peoples, which means everyone from the Middle East to Japan, uh, which, which traditionally means everyone from the Middle East to Japan. Now, of course, that's not a good idea because he means things like the British saying that the people in the Middle East are incapable of democracy and they need a viceroy. That's a bad essentialism. But sometimes I think it goes a little far. Sometimes, sometimes he says things like, anyway, you can't generalize about all Egyptians. There's just individual Egyptian people. However, that's not as progressive as it sounds politically because that's also what Margaret Thatcher said when she said society does not exist. There's only individuals and families. Right? You have to reduce everything to the individual level. And it's, in fact, is true. I lived in Egypt for 13 years and taught there for 16, last three commuting. And you better learn some things about Egyptian culture before you go. And there are always exceptions, but there are things that are, it's not a good idea to do in Egypt or things that will happen in Egypt that won't happen in America. And there will be exceptions, but they're generally true. Um, so for example, a, a student of mine in Cairo did telemarketing to the US as a night job. His English was perfect but he had to take a cultural course because his cultural knowledge wasn't perfect. And I, I asked him, what do they teach you about America? And he said, when you're trying to sell something to an American on the phone, don't ask them their salary and don't ask them if they're married, which of course goes without saying for us, those are invasive questions from a telemarketer. But those are very common questions from a taxi driver in Egypt. Definitely will ask you if you're married because everyone's trying to play matchmaker, right? And they'll often ask you your salary. Uh, in a way that is considered rude in the US where the salary is somehow reflecting your value as a person. And none of us want to reveal that any more than reveal our IQ if we took a test, right? Because it's something deeply personal to us, not so much in Egypt. And uh, you know, other things that are better known like not showing the bottom of your shoes in polite company. And some of them turned out to be laughably false. I read a book before I went to Egypt that said, if you see a baby in Egypt, you have to say that it's ugly and then wink to show that you don't mean it because otherwise the evil eye will kill the baby. And I told that to my students and they burst out laughing and they said that's true in small villages where people are illiterate, but not in Cairo, right? So in other words, there are certain things about cultures that while not quite essential, you'd better learn them. Otherwise you're gonna make a lot of faux pas, right? And so there is some room for essence there, I think. Anyway, go ahead, I see you. I, I think that that's not, I think that that's sort of a, a, a misuse of the term of essentialism, if that's what you're describing, because there, there's a lot of, I mean, when we think about, for example, a lot of people want to talk about intersectionality, for, you know, for example, and, and in that you would be thinking about exactly what you're talking about without calling it essentialism. So you don't actually, because essentialism harks back to a lot of things that are definitely not what, I mean, they're, they're fairly repugnant in a lot of ways, but there are ways to talk about what you're talking about that don't require the use of a term like that um, because what you're talking about is entirely sensible, yeah. And, and I'm only using essence because Aristotle uses it and that's the tradition I work from. And I understand that it's politically risky to use that word. Here's the other thing I wanted to say. I think it's dangerous to bind political positions too closely to ontological positions. And so I'm sometimes dismayed that so many contemporary feminisms are committed to a process ontology rather than an object-oriented ontology, because I don't think process is necessarily always liberating. It might seem liberating now compared to old static theories of essence, but that could flip just as easily, right? Because like, for example, the French Revolution, the social constructionists were the conservatives, right? 
the the universalists were the revolutionaries, universal rights of man, you know, liberty, equality, equality, fraternity. And then it's kind of flipped now. So the leftists are the social constructionists. So I kind of think there's an indeterminate relation between politics and and uh, I, I think politics. you're essentializing feminists. <laughs> well, maybe, but wouldn't you admit that an awful lot of feminists now are are more drawn to process philosophy than to substances? I, I think that there's a lot in feminist philosophy that actually doesn't go, that, that talks about social ontology rather than ontology in sort of a, a more traditional approach. And so, okay. and, and you know, so I do, I mean, I'm an epistemologist. So from my perspective, everything is created from the from the perspective of, of the knowledge of it, right? So, so I'm not gonna be worried, I'm not gonna be too worried about that, but I also would definitely resist the urge to categorize um, larger groups like feminist philosophers is one thing or another, because just like any other group of philosophers, if you put us all in one room, we'll yell at each other, so. <laughs> okay, but, but if you call, like if you talk about um, ordinary language philosophers, yes, they're different, or any group, they're all different, but there are certain features you can point to that are at least predominant at a certain time, right? And yeah. maybe, maybe rather than feminists, I would have to say continental process feminists, new materialist feminists, and then you can, then it's a little more accurate instead of saying feminist per se. Right. I agree. Yeah. I think Warren has a question. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, this is the most interesting thing like this I've been to in a couple of decades here. So I'm really excited. Um, uh, first, I, I just wondered if you might refer me to something because it's a question I don't think would be interesting to everyone. And then I, I had a question I thought might be a little more broad. Um, I'm a Deleuzian uh, very much in Manuel de Landa's um, kind of stamp. And I know you. I have a collection you've co-edited, but um, if you have um, any writing where you talk about your ideas in relation to Deleuze's idea of the virtual, I kept wondering about that. Um, and if, if you do, just put it in the chat. And if not, it's not a big deal. But um, what I thought might be more interesting is if you could say a few things about um, uh, your interest in Lovecraft. Right. Yeah, H.P. Lovecraft. I'll talk about that first, and then I'll answer your Deleuze question at the end. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft is, is he's really in fashion now. And now there's the Lovecraft Country TV series. Uh, that has reawakened a wider interest in him. Uh, I encountered Lovecraft pretty late, as I mentioned in my book on him. Uh, he, usually he's a discovery of teenage years. He's around the same time as Lord of the Rings, and some people see it as a kind of pulp horror, pulp science fiction. I only read him because there was a Library of America volume put out about him in 2005, and I thought, what? Lovecraft deserves that? I, I kind of assumed he was a pulp horror writer. So then I picked up that volume and started reading and it wasn't right away. It took me seven or eight stories to realize, hey, this guy's a really good writer. And there's some philosophical relevance to this. Okay, he's a racist, that's a problem. It's well known. Um, although he became a kind of FDR supporter at the end and turned on the Republicans. It was weird uh, what happened in his political journey. But anyway, um, I started realizing what's going on there is he is driving a wedge between objects and their qualities in two different ways, just like object-oriented ontology. Because on the one hand, Lovecraft's most signature gesture is to say, this statue of the monster is hard to describe, but it would not be entirely inaccurate to say it had a some -like, somewhat squid-like tentacled head and vaguely dragon-like wings. And yet there was something more about it, a vague general outline of the whole that made it terrifying. So he's putting something a little beyond language. And yet he's not just saying it's so weird, no pen can describe it. He's actually trying to describe it. He's doing the best to, tr to try it and show that it fails. There's that, but then there's also the other way he does it. Like when he's describing the crazy Antarctic city and at the Mountains of Madness, where he says, oh, no problem. It's a weird city and I'm gonna describe it. And he describes it in like these 10 flowery purple phrases that are very chilling, but then you somehow can't integrate them into one object in your, in your mind. It's almost like cubism. You see all these sides of somebody's face, but it can't really make sense to you as a whole. And so there's two things are going on in Lovecraft simultaneously. And I, I think he's an exemplary author in terms of pulling that off. And uh, I called it weird realism because of course he wrote weird fiction. He published in the magazine, Weird Tales. And so I tried to make weird into a technical term in philosophy, which means the weirdness is what happens when the object and their qualities come apart, which is something I try to talk about in my own work. What happens when the object and their qualities pull apart? You usually think of them as being one if you're David Hume. <laughs> 
well, there's ways to, to pull them out. So uh, yeah, Lovecraft has, has been very important for me. In terms of Deleuze and the Virtual, I'll, the person you want to read is Levi Bryant, who's my colleague in object-oriented ontology. There's the book called The Democracy of Objects because he comes from a Deleuzean background. And so there's a lot more Deleuze in his version of object-oriented ontology. What I always liked about Deleuze was his irreverence when I was a student. You know, his use of jokes, sometimes swear words. These are not the kinds of things you're used to seeing in philosophy books. Weird, weird analogies that he makes, he made me laugh. I never really got on board with the philosophy and it's because the, the again, this idea he seemed to have that the virtual is somehow continuous and individuation only happens at the surface level. And so we're, we're working against each other on that in that way. And that, incidentally, Devorah, that's, that's my worry about Spinoza too. And Spinoza and Deleuze are very close. And I know there's other ways to read Spinoza, but the fact that he has one substance and I like having so many substances. Um, so that's, that's what's going on there. The fact that I like pluralistic philosophies that have lots of individual entities jostling against each other. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer your question, but and then you can read the, the Absolutely. Book. Yeah, and I have uh, Libby and I are uh, Facebook friends, so okay. that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, I'm looking at the time. Um, perhaps we have time for one more question. If someone okay. has one. Sure. Um, would anyone else like to ask a question, of Professor Harmon? It's a separate question, but it relates to the Spinoza. And if any of my students are still here, they might be interested. So you were talking about sort of um, about progress as a sort of genealogical concept, which is great. Um, and so that makes sense to me. And similarly, while you were talking, I was thinking about your thoughts about substance, for example, and material. And so, you know, when you're in the modern period and you're looking at the development and the evolution of the concept of substance to matter, sort of the, the breaking apart of the, the substance, the corporeal, the matter, the flesh, and that and it goes in that direction. Those concepts are all different. So for example, with the Spinoza, right, we have things in hearing and substance, which is very different than things in hearing and matter. And so I, wanted, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit more about um, ways that, you know, potentially substance is not necessarily the thing that we're concerned about, but matter might be in an entirely different concept, or if that's sort of what you have in mind. Yeah, for me, substance is a form, and that's so. This kind of goes back to the medieval idea of substantial forms, which was kind of discarded with the advent of modern physics. But I think there's some use for that concept. The idea that a thing is essentially a form, and that it, it gets known or it, it influences another inanimate object through translation, something like translation. Uh, it doesn't. The form doesn't get extracted and moved because the form then changes, as I was saying. And so, an object is a form. I'd call it a substance, but not in the sense that. You know, a lot of philosophy has said substance has to be what's eternal, like the pre-Socratics and Plato and a lot of medieval philosophers. It doesn't have to be eternal. Aristotle already said, you know, a horse is a substance, a horse dies and the body rots. So substances are destructible. They don't have to be eternal or they just have to be somewhat durable in the sense that they have to be more durable than their qualities. They have to be able to sustain a change in qualities while remaining the same thing. And it's, it's hard to give criteria for that because we can be fooled by that, right? We might think that something is the same when it's actually changed. Like is Long Beach, California, the same city that Justin grew up in that I'm living in now or not? Has there been a substantive change? I don't know. I, I don't know what it was like then. Things like that, especially with artificial human created things are hard to know. Um, is delusionism today the same as it was in the mid nineties? We can always ask those questions. We can always ask questions like, do certain demographic groups really exist? Do soccer moms really exist? Or is that just a reification of something that's a statistical average or something? Um, so it remains elusive in a way that uh, substances were not usually thought to remain elusive. They were thought to be knowable. Whereas I've got enough Heidegger in me that I say, you can't get at it directly. It's gotta be oblique, it's gotta be indirect. And that's why a lot of times you learn the most from good writing rather than from exact figures and facts. Um, and we see this of course in, in biographies, right? A, you know, a great biography of say Napoleon isn't going to be great just because it got the most facts right and made the fewest mistakes. It's going to be the greatest because it somehow brings Napoleon alive. The author somehow gets Napoleon or Lincoln or whatever, whoever they're writing about, Marie Curie, and they're, they're really bringing that person to life for you somehow. Or an actor can do this. Um, I thought Daniel day Lewis's Lincoln was very good. Um, somebody I know said, you felt like you met Abraham Lincoln. Sort of did, right? He did a good acting job. You sort of felt like that was Lincoln in the flesh. And how did he do it? 
he didn't do it just by following a, an exact list of piecemeal rules. He somehow got the spirit of Lincoln Wright. And this is what method actors do, um, like him. I don't know if that was right on the bullseye of your question or not. It might not have been, but I can't hear you. You got muted. Uh, no, that was, that was informative. Thank you. Okay, sure. Wish we can continue this. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and for leading on this uh, wonderful lecture and for entertaining these uh, really insight incisive questions. And um, um, yeah, so let's let's all thank Professor Harmon for joining us. It's a little awkward <laughs> on the, with the clapping, um, but. Um, uh, thanks for joining Campus Theme, and I hope you'll accompany us in future events. Yes, and as I was telling Justin, uh, when we first arranged this, we thought it would be in person, and I happened to drive up from Long Beach up to Portland to attend my nephew's wedding, and we passed through Ashland, so I said, hey, I'm going to be lecturing here. I might as well look at the campus, so we pulled off, and I drove around your campus. It was around Christmas time 2019, so no one was around, but I, have, I, I was able to picture Southern Oregon University in my mind as I was giving this lecture, even though I had Enrique's face here the whole time. I was, I was picturing the campus as a whole. Lucky you. <laughs> yes. Southern Oregon University are like the same thing. <laughs> ah, oh, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Thank you. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Uh, Zoom. Yeah. All right. Thank you care. all. Right. We'll Thank see you, you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you very much.